Thanks for coming to Mustache in the Front, Mustache in the Rear. I know you had choices um, with the uh, birthday suit. Um, I lost my slides yesterday, so I want to apologize. Uh, my, my hard drive was, was encrypted, um, it was a bad move, and, uh, and then it, it got, uh, what do you call it, corrupted. Encrypted and corrupted, so on the plane I realized I had no slides. So uh, I did all this on my iPad because my computer's unusable. Apologies. My name is Patrick Ewing. Uh, I was center for the New York Knicks for about 10 years. <laughs> now, now I coach Miami Heat and uh, write code at Twitter. Um, so I'm, all, I'm the tech lead for the web client team. And uh, the team's changed a bit, but this is the team that built, uh, this, these are the engineers that built new Twitter. Obviously there's a lot more people who contributed to it who couldn't make it on the slide. But uh, it was a pretty small team. Uh, about seven engineers, and uh, it was a really awesome experience, I guess you could say, and also a really challenging one because the Twitter front end had remained pretty much unchanged since, I mean, it had been iteratively changed since its inception, but it was still a Rails app with ERB templates and uh, not a lot of, it had just sort of grown over time and something new was necessary. Um, one thing I found when I, so again, yeah, like, my handwriting is kindergarten style, I hope you guys enjoy that. Um, <laughs> I, uh, when I first got to Twitter, there, like, rendering was actually one of our biggest problems, um, which is not something I expected. I expected something with, you know, the massive amount of, of you know, scaling memcache or, or, like, sharding databases, like, these are all challenges, but at the time, they were, they were pretty much under control, but 12% uh, of our CPU time was actually t entirely used by rendering tweets. So when I say rendering is hard, I mean, I mean it that way. It's actually a lot of work to concat a huge complex template, uh, and that was, that was actually a huge problem. Uh, I also know it's hard because it's complex, like view code can get really squirrely really fast, um, it's always the, the easiest place for people to like tack one more thing on or uh, embed some business logic that goes untested because it's just view code and then later on ends up, you know, causing 404. Or, um, so rendering is hard. And mustache is a lot of things. I was thinking, so that's, those are mustaches. Who in this room has used or played with mustache at all? All right, so like about half of y'all. Um, so the things I like about mustache are that it's simple, it's fast, and it's everywhere. I will, um, I'll go through what I mean by that. So the mustache is simple both as an idea and as an implementation. Chris Wainstroth uh, modeled it off of C templates, and the idea is to have basically no logic or next to no logic in your view code as possible. Um, so the entire templating syntax can pretty much be covered in two slides, which I'll do. Um, it's also a very simple, like, pretty simple implementation. Um, there's a pretty basic parser, and then, I mean, if you drill down enough, it's some regexes, right? It's not, it's not fancy. Uh, this is, this, so yeah, I'll just do a quick touch, like, run over of the syntax. Um, Interpolation is done with double mustaches. You do template inclusion with a uh, uh, greater than, and uh, content is escaped by default. So you use the triple stash to when you want um, HTML unsafe characters. Then you got sections. All sections use this uh, hash syntax. So on the top, very basic conditional. We've all seen this before. Uh, you can enumerate over a collection. And we'll go into how Mustache knows that it's a collection. Um, and then you can uh, drill down into other objects with uh, this dereferencing thing. It all depends on the return, the, the type of uh, object that's returned from the Mustache view. We'll go into that. Um, but that's basically all there is to it. There's really not a lot. Um, there's not a lot to get hung up on, and I love I love that fact. I love that there's no need to test my views anymore because all the logic is is elsewhere. Um, 
And yeah, so that's pretty great. I also think the simplicity is what <coughs> lends itself to making the thing really fast. Um, I'll, uh, this is a super uh, technological <laughs> graph that I made um, based on memory uh, from the graph I originally had. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, I know it's pretty daunting, um, but benchmarks are very important and trustworthy, and you really can design your code around some hard, hard data um, that you've gathered. So that's, that's Hamel. Uh, it's pretty slow. ERB is also pretty slow. We found that Mustache RB was actually slightly slower than ERB, uh, but as fast if you catch these view objects that it generates. I'll go into that. They're basic, it's basically comparable to ERB in, in Ruby. Um, but then if you look at uh, Mustache JS on the right, it's actually faster than every jQuery UI and, and uh, jQuery templating system I can find. It's blazingly fast. Um, so that's interesting. Um, so when I say mustache is everywhere, I mean that there's an implementation for pretty much any language that I, I know a programmer works in, if, that's, if that makes sense. Um, I've seen Java, Scala, C++, PHP, Python, Ruby, JavaScript, um, it goes on and on. It's so simple to implement, I think people just kind of start doing it as an afterthought, and there's a pretty active community of people who are um, pushing these implementations forward. Um, so, oh, and it's also everywhere because we started using it at Twitter almost a year ago, uh, first in little places. So, if anyone remembers hover cards, uh, some people love them, some people hated them, but those were mustaches uh, rendered on the client. And that's, that was the first place where we chose to use it. So, in addition to ERB, which was rendering all the tweets, we uh, were using mustache to render this like extra layer on top of tweets called hover card. Uh, then there was this at Angular project, um, which was really a really cool way of extending Twitter into other websites. So you could um, like at names on other sites, or fully you could interact with them like you could within Twitter, right? Reply, reply to people, tweet at them. And these were hover cards that were I'm sorry, these were mustaches that would render on other sites. Again, mustache JS. And then when it came to new Twitter, we were like warming up to the idea so much and had really gotten used to it, that um, we basically decided to do the entire thing in Mustache. So, this is like a big question, right? Um, everyone who's worked in Rails is really comfortable with the Rails view stack, and there's something that seems a little bit conceptually simpler to me about returning a complete page and then updating it uh, as needed with like little other bits of HTML. So why do we render on the client? And there's there's like so many reasons for and against this. I couldn't possibly go into them all, but we found a number of really good good reasons as we develop this. So again, I want to say that this is really fast. Um, it's it's fast for us for a number of reasons. We send much less data over the wire because we are just sending down the template once, and then we're sending down just raw JSON data. And so this is like about halves what's coming down in transport. And um, JavaScript interpreters have gotten really, really fast. There's just so much research being done into making them speedy that, uh, like, I, like I showed you before with the computer science, uh, it's very, it, was just, it was just really, uh, uh, like the fastest way, I don't know, JavaScript is fast at sticking strings together. I don't know, it's, it's remarkable. Um, and we also find that it's really easy to share um, your view code when it's in this format because you could share it across, you could share it across language boundaries is one of the most interesting things. Um, because the template is language agnostic and there's implementations uh, across these different languages, if you have a clean API, you could do your rendering anywhere, in theory. Um, and we'll get more to how that actually, we'll get into how that works in practice. Um, it's also great for an organization that um, reuses data objects and, and needs to display them in different contexts for, for you to basically be able to fetch views over HTTP. So 
uh, someone who's building a micro app within the within the company could just pull down your view code because it, it view you know it's it's open source and sitting around on an HTTP endpoint and using this very small mustache JS uh, library glom it together and be rendering the exact same HTML that you're rendering at Twitter.com. So that's cool. Um, another reason that we chose to do it came out of the Anywhere project. Um, the Anywhere project yielded this thing called the JavaScript API. It was actually sort of like a spike that uh, was not, I wouldn't say it's essential to what at Anywhere did, but it was the work of uh, a few people, primarily this, uh, this guy, uh, DSA, DSA, and uh, it's this awesome chainable way of accessing Twitter's REST API from JavaScript. So if anyone has uh, wants to play with this, there's still like a preview version up. It unfortunately isn't like finished publicly yet, um, but it's it's really powerful. And you'll see that what we're doing here is we've got an API object we can find on it, and then we're just chaining calls jQuery style, and then inside this uh, callback we're creating a a mustache view. So that's that's um, the two parts of the mustache like world are the template, which is that simple like HTML or whatever with the basic mustache uh, syntax, and the view object. So that's like, you could compare it to a presenter. It's kind of just a data hash that's decorated with a few extra methods or functions for like, you know, um, Basically like a helper in Rails, you could compare it to that, but it encapsulates all of the data that you're going to be rendering in your view. So the view object knows how to render itself there, and um, this turns out to be pretty pretty cool and really, really rapid for building a uh, Twitter client. The JavaScript API lends itself to that. So then the question is, if rendering JavaScript is so great, and like really who do I think I am coming to RubyConf and telling you how awesome JavaScript is at rendering, um, are we are we done? Like, why why not just do all of our apps on the client? Um, well, no, no, you can't do that. Um, for one thing, we want to maintain accessibility, and there still are uh, something like three percent of internet users in the United States have JavaScript turned off. I think that's staggeringly high. It's weird that it's so high in the U.S. In Brazil, it's like 0.03. Um, so I don't really know why the US still has so many people not using JavaScript. But then, then there's also just the matter of devices that don't support it uh, at all, like screen readers, et cetera. Um, we also need to send down the initial page. So um, if you've seen new Twitter, you know it like comes down with the like kind of basic Chrome. And like you know, you can see that you're logged in in the upper in the top menu, and you've got like so we we've, we've got to render that server side. Um, and then, and we also we also do this thing. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> when I was talking about it being faster on the client, I should note that we did try rendering um, server side. In uh, first, we we actually tried it tried using V8 and Spider Monkey on the server, um, which would which was a very interesting experiment. So it would be JavaScript on the mustache in the front, mustache in the back, but it would be mustache JS in both places. Um, we ended up not being able to do it just because maintaining old Twitter and new Twitter at the same time, uh, w like we didn't, we basically didn't have the capacity to add a new VM to the mix. Like it just wasn't going to happen. So um, we need to render. But well, anyway, anyway, we need to render server side so that we can precede the cache. This this means that um, we don't want to do an initial fetch when you. Uh, when the page is loading, we don't want to like load your whole page for you and then start fetching data uh, from the API. Um, so what we do instead is we use mustache on the server to embed JSON in the page. Uh, so rather, we actually found that this is faster than um, rendering HTML on the server, right? So we, we had a Ruby and we had a mustache Ruby view stack that could render all the same templates as uh, mustache JS, but it was actually faster to not do that and to instead basically just transform, uh, just embed JSON as a string in the page body and use, and then uh, after that was sent down, the client would render it. So 
that was pretty interesting. And then lastly, you need to render server side for the Google. Um, if you want to, if you want the juice, the Google juice, uh, you need to uh, they need to be able to index your stuff. And um, so there's if you've noticed the hash bang URLs in the new Twitter, like where it's uh, we've added that kind of ugly little blemish. Uh, that's that's ultimately for the Google and for anyone who will uh, be able to basically so we can send them rendered content uh, that they ask for that's not in JavaScript. So we do we do need to render on the server for them for the bots. So this is what we ended up having. Like this was our this was our view stack. Um, primarily mustache JS, uh, mustache RV for uh, rendering the initial layout and preceding the cache, and um, for the Google bot, and and then these shared templates. Um, okay, so I was going to dig a little bit more into how this works, and so that we can look at like what is this? What does this mean to share a template? So, right. So just a yeah, quick reminder: the template is the HTML string, uh, you know, the, you know, a file living somewhere in your file system and available uh, at, a, at a URL um, that contains text and the mustache syntax. And then the view is a, an object. So if you're going to share, if you, so basically you don't need an object to use mustache. All you need is a hash. In mustache RB and mustache JS, you can pass it a data object and it will uh, render it appropriately. Uh, but of course we know that like not, APIs should usually not be in any way concerned with display and presentation logic, it should be data. So sometimes you can just render a, Render data directly to HTML. It's no big deal. Often, you know, you need to string format uh, a date time. You need to uh, dig into a user and like combine their their name in some fancy way. Uh, so, what we've got here are two view objects. Uh, one in JavaScript and one in Ruby. Now they're kind of pseudocode, uh, but this is roughly what you see in our in our view stack. Um, we've got inheritance and we've got a methods block so that this, this base tweet uh, shares the ability to refresh itself from the API and it has, uh, it, mo it modifies the data that's assigned to its uh, instance variables, right? So it returns a boolean for uh, whether it's a top tweet or not and it uses our utility linkify function for, um, for rendering linked text. Uh, over here, we've got a stream tweet in the Ruby view stack. Um, here, context is basically the original hash that uh, you passed in that we, we got from the uh, we got from Rails on the Ruby side. And so you can see, actually, the first two are exactly the same, right? You can see that it's there's so little here that we need to do that it's it's uh, it's ba it barely diverges from the JavaScript code. Uh, the last one I included just as an example of like, what if I don't like I don't want to give up all my nice Rails helpers, so we just uh, include URL rewriter in our views base class, and then you can uh, super to it with the user screen name to get the profile path for that user. Um, that's the the need for that is because Mustache has no like methods have no arguments, there's no chaining. Uh, so if you want something to be displayed in your view, you do need to create a function for exactly what you need. Uh, in this case, you're just saying for a, for a tweet, I'm always going to be pointing towards the, the user who wrote this tweet. That's the profile path. So those are, you know, this is some code duplication right here, right? Everyone's a little nervous. All right, good. <laughs> um, and then this, this would be an example of the view. And I, I include this just to show you kind of like what a complex, a somewhat complex mustache template looks like. I'm sorry, yeah, this is the template. And uh, a lot of people are probably like, half the crowd is probably, I'm guessing, really into this because it's, it's code and it's a lot of code. It's all mixed up together. A lot of people are probably retching because it looks really ugly compared to a lot of other templating libraries. Uh, and I feel both of those. Um, we, uh, yeah, well, there's still internal debates about the merits of this as opposed to like Hamel or things that other people sometimes fall in love with. 
Um, anyway, so if this was a partial inside, let's say that this we were iterating over these, and this this is a we're dereferencing a tweet object at the top. So we're saying everything inside here is going to be called on, on this tweet context. Um, we do triple stash on the linkified text because it's already been HTML escaped and then linked. So at names are linked, hashtags are linked, etc. And then um, we dig into the user. So the tweet has a sub object called user, and then screen name references that. Uh, so it's not the screen name of tweets on the user. Uh, we check that is top tweet boolean. Uh, and then retweeters, we actually didn't have to modify our view object at all. Retweeters is, is returned to us from the JavaScript API. So that's an uh, enumerable. And so for each of those retweeters, we're getting the screen name of the, of the retweeter. And that's it. Yeah? Mustache uh, checks the type on the view. So uh, I wish I could tell you off the top of my head what it does to check. I think it's just checking that it's an array. Uh, I don't think you, in, in Ruby mustache, it would be any enumerable. In JavaScript, I believe it's, it has to be an array. Uh, <coughs> or it could be a collection with, uh, that responds to length. You're, you're absolutely right, <coughs> yeah. And so the, I personally think that the, the hash syntax is a little overloaded. I don't see why you wouldn't, because um, obviously you can't. This wouldn't mean this wouldn't mean much if retweeters was a single element, right? Um, and there's no way of knowing from the template. You you it it definitely pairs the template to the view object very tightly, and it depends on the type returned there. So it's pretty it's pretty loosey goosey in that regard. Um, but we also, we haven't had any trouble with that so far. Um, the templates for us have remained pretty static. Uh, yeah? Mustache respects white space. Yeah. Which is, which is good because we often end up using it like in class, in classes, like in, in attributes, we'll, in HTML attributes we'll end up Doing mustaches for does this does this class render here, etc. And you need it to respect white space. <laughs> Good question. If anyone wants to shout out questions, we could wait for, till the end, but like we could also just go now. So I was going to discuss discuss some drawbacks that we had. Um, this was an interesting one. JavaScript and Ruby, as we all know, have different coding conventions, uh, and it was getting the JavaScript programmers and the Ruby programmers at Twitter on the same page. And I mean, a lot we're all polyglots, but basically the, this was really not what I expected. But one of the biggest problems we ran into was camel case versus snake case. Uh, <laughs> nobody <laughs> wants to change their case. All of, Java, all of JavaScript and all of the like DOM API in browsers is, is camelized and everything in Ruby is snake case. And I think that whichever you use first always would seem kind of right to you. And so if you're sharing a view template, you're often calling attributes right on your data format. So it, it, whichever uh, convention you choose will end up uh, really changing your API and defining a lot of things. So this is like, it actually kind of became an impasse um, that had a really bad compromise at the end that we call the camel snake. <laughs> so, uh, if you, yeah, there's some really, really clever programmers on the team. And uh, this one fella managed to uh, basically, in the JavaScript API, uh, rewrite all. Um, of the Twitter API attributes in camel in camel case. So you know he wanted it to be a JavaScript API for JavaScript programmers. So all your you know you should be able to write code the way you're used to doing it. Well, he but he also made he also left the original uh, variables accessible. You could dig into it like a data object and do that. So since we were uh, sharing between Ruby and JavaScript and uh, we basically, 
like we Ruby programmers were like, we'll use snake and we'll just we'll reference the original snake variables. The problem is where does that where does it stop? And when you're writing new functions in JavaScript to wrap this stuff, you start uh, modifying or overloading the snake version instead of the camel version, or you write a new function and you only include the camel version, and then who really wants two versions of all functions anyway, and which one do you use at any given time? It became a wreck. Uh, and we actually had a we had a like a, a counter on our whiteboard. We we're like all in a in a war room working on this thing for four months. And we had a counter days since bitten by the camel snake. Uh, and it was like zero or negative one uh, often. Uh, this yeah, this would be any time you tried to try to call it one way and you'd find that the property was only available the other way. So uh, we're actually pulling that out right now and uh, standardizing on camel. Um, another uh, drawback was Mustache has no internationalization support. Uh, this is very important for pretty much everybody in the room, I think. Um, so the option out of the box is you can just define functions for every English string in your app, where you, uh, yeah, that's horrible. Uh, so we uh, wrote this uh, under stash, I believe is what we called it, um, which uh, you can wrap it's, it's just another mustache tag. And mustache is actually very, uh, we're surprised how easy it was to extend. Um, so any string that you want or any block of text, you can wrap in under stash and it's passed to Twitter's internationalization system. Um, and it works. I'm sad to say we've not contributed this back to mustache.js. Um, just as soon as the bugs stop and the whales are at bay, um, we fully intend to. <laughs> And then the last thing that you really need if you're going to do this approach where, you know, it, ideally your API is such that you don't have to do a lot of logic even in your view objects, right? You can just uh, call the data properties and, and spit them out. And especially for the most important things like Boolean switches and uh, the types of like what you're enumerating over and um, what's, and, and Mustache is fairly gracious about nils and empty strings, it usually just swallows swallows errors by default. You can turn that off. But uh, I actually kind of ended up liking that quite a bit. Um, but if you want to have any sort of logic, and you will, in your view objects, you need to have tests that test both against the same expectation. So the way that we manage this in the Twitter text library, which is available, Twitter text RB, Twitter text JS, and I think people are, are forking this on GitHub and also porting it to other languages is we have a separate GitHub project called Twitter Text Conformance. And um, basically all that is is a series of YAML files that state inputs and desired outputs. And all you do in your, uh, your re-implementation is you write a small test harness that feeds the uh, YAML files, which are broken down by what function they test, into uh, into the function that's tested in your library and assert that the output is valid. And that um, so you can just like include it as a git sub module or um, something less frightening. And um, that that tends to work pretty well. And I think that brings me to the end of the this tale of this tale. Yeah. Thanks.